Hello, I hope you're well. My name is Sonali Cooper. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student studying psychology at UBC Okanagan. My areas of research focusing on cannabis with Dr. Zachary Walsh and graduate student Sarah Daniels, as well as being a student coordinator for the UBC student recovery community. This includes helping outreach for the program and organizing collaborations with other recovery initiatives and researchers. I would like to start off this workshop presentation by doing land acknowledgements. I acknowledge that I live, learn, and work on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples in Musqueam First Nations. I would like to take a moment to address the importance of the connection to the land we share, using any platform we have to address and respect our Indigenous communities. This is the first of many steps towards reconciliation. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I encourage you to seek out what Indigenous land you reside on and reflect on what that means to you. If you are unsure how to do so, you can find out on nativeland.ca, which I have left a resource for. Welcome to the first student recovery community of its kind in Canada. I'm happy you're here. This is a safe and inclusive space for any student with lived experience of addiction and for those curious to explore their relationship with alcohol, drugs, or other types of addictive behavior. We support all pathways of recovery, harm reduction, abstinence, and everything in between. By joining this community, you will be co-creating an atmosphere that supports your journey. The UBC SRC has been established for students by students. Everyone you will meet here has had lived experience of addiction and or recovery. The SRC provides weekly peer support meetings called all recovery meetings, one-on-one -on -one peer support and gender diverse meetings for students in or curious about recovery. Through raising awareness and combating stigma, our dialogues are changing the way we recovery and addiction are understood in post-secondary settings and beyond. The SRC can serve as a protective factor for anybody who uses. In further detail, we are lowering the likelihood of negative outcomes, which in this instance is people tragically losing their lives to overdose. If you really think about it, the SRC can define the whole idea of what harm reduction truly is. There are sub-branches towards the community being a protective factor, such as using positive reinforcement and alternative pathways to sobriety or other recovery goals. We use peer support and encouragement to aid in the grueling process of leaving a bad mindset that may have been started with addictive behaviors. When it comes time to define addiction, I like to use examples of addictive behaviors. Any behavior that in your life harms you or that you feel you do not have control over. Addiction in its simplest form can be compared to sugar. Oftentimes, people do not monitor their sugar consumption, which leads to them underestimating their overall intake of it. After realizing over a long period of time sugar is poorly impacting your health, it may be time to change something. If you cut sugar off cold turkey like on a keto diet, you would go through withdrawal. You would experience cravings, headaches, and even perhaps mood swings. This would be especially challenging when you encounter stress in your life. A chocolate bar after a long day would sound heavenly once you cut them out of your life. Or perhaps you choose a different route and cut down your usage of sugar over time to something you are okay with. It may take a few tries, but the right resources are there that can fit your needs. This idea of sugar can mirror the model of the student recovery community. Sometimes addiction is severe and can make people sick just like a disease. In those instances, people may find themselves having to quit something cold turkey. Other times, it may be a gradual quitting. So the point is, one is no way valuable, more valuable than the other. And we respect anybody with the courage to show up and try. Addiction has no face and comes in many forms. But I think as humans, we share the common experiences of loneliness and sadness in our own ways. This principal feeling can project worry on our minds. And rather than addressing the problem, it is oftentimes much easier to avoid it with some sort of distraction. It made me question when our distractions start to become disruptive, do we seek addictive changes? No matter what we use, if it's a behavior or a substance, we're using it to escape some sort of painful feeling that has given by our human experience. A recent conversation I had had me reflecting on how our brains are known to be malleable, a growth mindset I like to call it, which can elevate recovery as it is constantly giving intrinsic pushes to continue moving forward. The one stuck in the isolation of addiction 
it is easier to turn away from your issues and face them. If we look at countries such as Portugal and how they dealt with their addiction crisis, I found their models to be effective as they are based in social connection and physical rehabilitation. Though the overdose crisis in British Columbia has a different circumstance, I find our current healthcare services take an alternative approach to rehabilitation that does not reflect what was successful in Portugal. I would argue it might be because of cultural differences. Portugal is filled with festivity and social connection, and this is oftentimes shared by food with our loved ones. Addiction is a disease that attacks every aspect of your life. When people face trauma or any sort of stress in their lives, we search for comfort. This comfort can be found through food, video games, or whatever speaks to you. Substances have a close and intimate connection and may distract us from the outside world. The problem lies when our minds trick us into believing that these distractions are good for us, but really they're detaching us from the reality we're in and prevent us from going forward as individuals. When it comes time to substance use, people feel connection to their usings. And the reality is, when it comes to recovery, you need to find connection and meeting in things that are not substances or any behavior that is problematic to you, your usings per se. We can become so immersed into whatever we feel connection to, and when it's drug use, we lose sight of the things that made us happy beforehand. I learned once in a lifespan development course about different attachment styles and how individuals who have insecure attachments are especially susceptible to potentially face addiction. We often look at addiction in form to substance use, leading to tragedies such as overdose. But when you look at the route causes of how their addiction journey started, there is a major overlap between attachment figures and addiction. Children need attachment, and so does the developing mind. I believe childhood is a route cause of addictive behavior especially in instances where families do not feel connected to one another. Those pivotal developmental years mirror some of the experiences we face as adults, the habits we build, and the type of social connections we encounter. This idea can be further explained by the work of Dr. Gabor Mate. He has moved mountains for policy research addressing addiction, and specifically youth addiction. He provides a trauma-informed perspective that is multi-generational in how it has led us to the overdose crisis today. His perspectives are eye-opening, and I would highly recommend reading his books or watching his recorded presentation at the conference today. When looking at situations such as the downtown east side in Vancouver, it is a multifaceted issue that has many components such as a social, political, and having our basic needs met. As somebody who grew up in the Vancouver area, it is heartbreaking to see how overdoses impacted the province of British Columbia and Canada overall. I think it's important to highlight the work of harm reduction services, services that do not shame people for coming forward. UBC Okanagan has introduced a harm reduction services team. They go by the HEART team. They say adolescence is one of the loneliest times in your life, and universities often see this, especially during the winter months. There are increases in youth drug use, overall depression, and suicide rates heighten. In those instances, harm reduction support services are pivotal to those in recovery as well as active addiction. I have left a link to their website in the chat and on the final resources slide. Services such as drug checking encourages people to look into what they are using as an early preventative measure. Early intervention is not always possible, though in the instances we can put in early measures that can set someone up for success through whatever recovery journey they might be on. These early measures can be found through ongoing research some of these strategies are published guides and studies, though overall, these are things that I have had the opportunity of collecting that seem small, but make a major difference on other people's lives. I would like to revisit the idea of how addiction tackles every aspect of your life. And though I'm at the end of my undergraduate degree, I have many years of education left to go. And through my own eyes and experience, I have seen research change the lives of many. I have seen how these next programs have impacted people's lives firsthand in their effectiveness, starting with the work in the Therapeutic, Recreational, and Problematic Substance Use Lab with Dr. Zachary Walsh. I've had the opportunity to help his graduate student, Sarah Daniels, with her work around cannabis and yoga. Though I cannot speak for other people's research, I can speak for how being around them and learning from their work has impacted my approach to recovery initiatives. Yoga is a versatile form of exercise that engages us in various mindfulness practices. From sun salutations to hot yoga, your mind and body are benefiting from the experience. And it was not until recently did I understand about the overlap between spirituality and mindfulness practices. 
A starting point to my learning is understanding our connection to nature. And similar to the start of this presentation, our connection to land is pivotal towards recovery. When it comes to nature, I use the mind, body, soul analogy. When we find our minds wanting to be isolated, I think it's the time we need connection the most. Connection to others is an extremely important element to well being, but our connection to ourselves and learning self sufficiency stays equally as important. A start to connecting with ourselves would be grounding ourselves to the use of nature. This is a progressive change that comes through steps that are like stepping stones. It starts by going outside and being present to your surroundings. It will train the dopamine reward complex in our brains to feel good. As mentioned in the article, How to Notice Nature, we would more or less be immersing our five senses. As much as we can condition our brains to be only satisfied by substance, we can uncondition them and find joy in new things. Dr. Holly M. Passmore is somebody that I have had the honor of knowing. She is a professor at Concordia University in Edmonton. I have left links to her website as she has done research about connection to nature and its importance on our well being. On the opposing side, she does research on the meaning in life and that her work highlights the importance of social connection to others. At the end of the day, humans are social animals. It was from that I learned the importance of value of having balance in my own life, which is when I realized people who are isolated do not likely have this resource. So this led me to my further insight of the overlap between positive psychology and addiction. I have had the pleasure of learning under Dr. Derek Wirtz. Him, along with his colleagues and Ed Diener created the Enhance program. This is a workbook that addresses things such as effective goal setting, developing habits, and regular reflection, learning the importance of sleep and nutrition. This stood out to me as a resource for the recovery community. It is self-paced and there is no teacher. It is only a resource that can help someone if they are willing to look in the mirror. During their clinical trials, they did see improvements in overall well-being and social relationships. I hope in the future we can use this as a stepping stone to help retrain brains in withdrawal to go back to a growth mindset. These habits make people realize that their isolation can be changed to connection and how there is value in their life outside of substance use or addictive behaviors. Similar to Dr. Passmore, I have left resources to the PDF version of the Enhanced Workbook, as well as details of the research and a link to the Core Lab at UBC Okanagan. It can be a starting point to further information for anybody who is curious. This is not a concrete measure of research, though through my experience, pets have been pivotal to many people's recovery journey. These photos entail my dog, Myla, and in the second one, she was doing yoga alongside me. Connection to others can be overwhelming, especially after a pandemic. Our connection to animals is unconditional. This does not work for everybody, but pets do encourage responsibility, companionship, good habits, and establishing boundaries. I would argue some people's connection to their animals are life-changing because of the support and stability they can provide for us. I want this presentation today to stay hopeful as isolation is not forever. All the resources, and initiatives I speak about today are things that I see work for individuals more than our current healthcare system can offer. As mentioned earlier, trust can be difficult to establish. Learning to trust is a long process that does not come easily to anybody. Animals can demonstrate learning trust over time, setting boundaries, creating routines, and showing nurturance. Forming a deep trusting connection with the pet can mirror the potential to have deep connections to one another. As it comes time to end my presentation before showing everybody the start of an all recovery meeting and how it runs, I have left the primary contact information for the UBC SRC. The Instagram is the easiest way to get in touch with upcoming events, community involvement, and research opportunities. Once getting connected via Instagram, you can join our online Slack community, which has channels with other recovery members, groups such as milestones, meeting topics, and a warm hello. It is a safe space for community members to speak to one another. After hearing this presentation, I encourage anybody with a mere interest in recovery to become an ally, to familiarize themselves with effective resources that can help the people around you, even if you're not directly suffering from addiction. And to anybody who is in recovery or active addiction, the community recognizes and appreciates your efforts and wholeheartedly welcomes you to join the SRC by any means that suits you. 
If it's only listening during meetings, that's okay. We recognize the courage it takes to come forward to challenge a behavior that is harming you and use your outreach to help find resources that might work best for your individual recovery. No matter who you are, how you identify, your recovery path of choice, we value and fully support you. The second set of links is the harm reduction team at UBC Okanagan. I revisit this topic of early intervention and harm reductive measures as youth overdose rates are rising globally. An example of an effective early overdose prevention measure can be seen through the change of school policy at UBC Okanagan, offering on-site drug checking services at all university events. The placement of this is imperative. Anybody who is in the ticket line will have the option to reflect on if they would like their drugs checked free of charge. Lastly is my contact information. This topic I've spoken about today is very dear to me, and it's an honor to have the opportunity to speak today. I am always happy to speak to anybody about recovery in general or recovery initiatives. Now comes time for the workshop aspect. I will be demonstrating when an all recovery meeting starts and looks like. We traditionally go around and say our names in the meeting, though since this is being recorded, we cannot do that. Hello again, welcome to this all recovery meeting. As you know, my name is Sonali. An all recovery meeting welcomes all with lived experience or of addiction or curious to explore their relationship with alcohol, drugs, or other types of behavior. An all recovery meeting means all pathways of recovery are embraced here. Some all recovery participants may be members of other groups, such as smart recovery or 12 step groups. So you may hear comments from those programs in this meeting. Here, we support any pathway that helps you and your individual recovery goals and are not affiliated with any specific group. Today, I will choose a universal recovery topic and we will discuss it. You are not required to speak, share a video, or use your real name. It's, a part it's okay to participate just by listening if you prefer. Coming from a place of mutual respect and understanding, let's observe some basic meeting agreements. As members of the student recovery community, we agree to create and maintain an environment that respects diverse traditions, heritages, and experiences. We acknowledge and honor the fundamental value and dignity of all individuals and agree there is no room for discrimination of any kind. We empathize with those of us who find this to be a difficult subject to speak on. We agree to be gentle with ourselves and one another, assume positive intent and honor each individual's unique journey, no matter what that looks like. We refrain from glorifying any kind of substance use or addictive behavior. One person speaks at a time, place your microphone on mute if others are speaking, and please honor confidentiality. This means what is shared and who shared it does not leave this space. For privacy reasons, this is a recording, so this is not inclusive of the all recovery meeting held during the conference out of respect to those who did share. I encourage you to come to a real all recovery meeting through the community if you would like an immersive experience on what that is actually like. That leads me to the end of this presentation and thank you for listening today. I had a lovely time doing this and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference videos. Thank you.